Okay, hello again. Uh, as I introduced myself a few minutes ago, I am Rabia Bilgücü, uh, an assistant student at the Smart Cities and Digital Ecosystems Lab. Uh, this is the second of the seminar series organized by the Top Ed to the Smart Cities and Digital Ecosystems Lab. Uh, the talk will take around 45 minutes. Uh, approximately in every two weeks, we will have uh, distinguished speakers all around the world. Uh, to introduce our invited speaker today, I first uh, give the word to Professor Dr. Mehmet Akshit, uh, who is the head of our lab. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, just a second. Uh, we had some echo here. I tried, We tried to remove. Uh, I know uh, Dr. Semi Chetin for quite some time. Uh, we cooperated in many events. I'm very thankful that he could make time for this talk. Uh, let me briefly introduce him. Uh, he has uh, achieved all BSc, MSc and PhD degrees from the Department of Computer Engineering at Middle East Technical University. Uh, he has worked as software engineer, project manager, R&D co coordinator, and in a later stage, together with two partners, he has co-founded Cybersoft Information Technologies in 1995, so quite some time ago. Uh, he, the company and uh, himself and his colleagues uh, did great work in software engineering, software architecture. For example, uh, they are known as the largest imp uh, information system implementation in Turkey. VDOP has been completely architected, uh, designed and developed by Cybersoft in 2003. Cybersoft has been awarded with the most prestigious IT award in the world, known as Oscars of IT. Uh, Dr. Chetin is not only doing uh, you know, uh, system development, but he has been involved in many MSc and PhD uh, theses at several universities. Besides that, he is an active member of Association for Evalu Evaluation and Accreditation of Engineering Programs. He has published and presented more than 40 academic papers in top class journals as well as conferences. Uh, Dr. Chetin is also active member of Association of Highly Tech Inventors by Middle East Technical University. He has been entitled, entitled as the Entrepreneur of Year of the Year 2012 for Technopark Investors by Matthew Young Entrepreneurs Group Club. Uh, so I'm very happy to introduce him here. Uh, I think we will have about 40-45 minutes presentation and then there will be questions. Uh, thank you for coming here again. Uh, the world is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ashit. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, for this kind invitation and uh, presenting me the opportunity to talk about uh, not a brand new topic, uh, but uh, getting popularity in recent years, the digital native systems. And I would like to thank to all participants here uh, for their time and dedication. Let's move on. Uh, I would like to share the screen if I can do that. Uh, can you imagine uh, someone is giving a talk about digital native systems, but he is not a digital native? Is that everything all right now? Now it's okay. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, this topic is going to be about uh, designing digital native systems. Uh, maybe you have heard the term digital native. Uh, but I'm not quite sure, uh, though the topic is uh, almost 20 years old. Uh, I'm going to uh, summarize what is a digital native first, then what, how it differs to digital immigrants, and what are the, the differences between them. And right after that, uh, I will try to uh, introduce a, a way to design uh, new generation systems for the digital native generations. Let's move on. Uh, the topic, uh, the, 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 sorry, the talk uh, has uh, the following content. Uh, of course, uh, if someone is talking about design, uh, about designing as something, there should be a methodology behind that. And uh, for this talk, I will be using the contemporary design approach known as design thinking and my uh, presentation is structured around the uh, major steps of design thinking, and I will uh, try to emphasize 
every step uh, by looking at the details of uh, designing digital native systems. As you know, uh, design thinking approach uh, have some variations. Uh, and I have just selected uh, the one that I liked most. Uh, it consists of six uh, different steps. And at every step, as I told you before, I'm trying to uh, explain uh, what is the problem, how uh, we can come up with a solution, and how we can implement that uh, design in the real life, and uh, what are the feedbacks. And uh, for the real life case, I will be stressing about the uh, famous German startup uh, Mambu. Uh, it's a, a unicorn, and uh, they are very well known as uh, one of the early implementers of digital native systems. So let's move on to the uh, presentation. Uh, first, how the uh, approach uh, for designing digital native systems. Uh, let's see. Uh, the approach itself first. Uh, this is the uh, design thinking approach that I will be using for the presentation. Uh, as any design thinking approach, it should uh, comprise three major steps. One of them is understanding the uh, situation, understanding the problem. Second one is exploring the alternatives to that problem. Third one is materialize the final product. And within the context of the, these three major steps, uh, I will be talking about first uh, conducting the research, then defining the problem, then ideating the uh, solution, then implementing somehow, then uh, testing the implementation and collecting the feedback and uh, putting uh, the real uh, case into the life. Let's go with the first step. You know that uh, digitalization is uh, all around us, uh, especially uh, with the introduction of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And everybody is talking about digital, digital, e-commerce is digital, banking uh, uh, services are digital, uh, logistics are digital, uh, government is digital, education is digital, even such sort of uh, events are digital. So uh, digital, and digitalization uh, uh, are inevitable part of our life. But uh, the digitalization and the digital world can be seen from different eyes. Uh, we can divide it into two. One of them is from the eye of the digital natives, uh, which I will be explaining uh, a few uh, minutes more. And the other viewpoint is our own viewpoint I'm talking about by myself. Uh, this is the viewpoint of the digital immigrants. Uh, the first uh, row is showing uh, the viewpoint of digital immigrants. If uh, we are uh, making sports and jogging, uh, our uh, typical understanding is just uh, first prepare for the run, then run, then uh, get some rest after the run. Uh, as we are digital immigrants. But uh, for the digital natives, it's lit the story is a little bit different because they are starting the uh, uh, music first while they are jogging. Then during the jogging time, during the running time or the sports time, they are taking selfies. And right after the sports, uh, they are busy with sharing uh, with their social media. And on the second part of the uh, screen, you can see that, uh, uh, by the way, I have to confess that uh, I was one of the early users of the Nokia uh, Gigaset telephone. And yes, it was quite uh, a strong one, uh, but it was not as functional as the one as iPhone or uh, today's modern uh, smartphones. Then, as I told you, the, the topic was introduced uh, almost 20 years ago, and the first paper was written by uh, Mark Kransky. And uh, uh, after uh, his first uh, article, uh, just uh, 16 days, 60 days later, he has introduced another uh, continuation article. And in uh, those articles, he discussed about the two generations, two different generations, digital natives and digital immigrants. Uh, however, uh, for both of uh, his articles, he could not uh, put uh, strong evidences. Yeah, he introduced the topics, he introduced the uh, concepts, but uh, did not provide uh, strong evidences. Uh, in the following uh, years, uh, people uh, took that uh, topic uh, into account. And right after uh, seven years ago, uh, another group, uh, Sue Burnett, 
Carl Mayton and Lisa Kerwin uh, just introduced uh, the concept with strong evidences. Yeah, there is a digital divide between two different generations. The first generation is the digital immigrants and the second generation, the new generation is the digital natives. And following the uh, people uh, delved into the details uh, how uh, the environment is affecting or how the environment is changing the life of digital natives. And with the introduction of uh, Web 2.0, uh, you know, the, the web uh, was turned out to be a push uh, ar uh, architecture from the pool architecture and uh, means that people started to share their uh, work and their ideas and their uh, content. And all these uh, improvements in the uh, web technology, they changed their life and their mindset. And nowadays we are talking about a new generation. This is known as the digital native generation. Now let's see, uh, in a clear picture, the digital natives are those who were born uh, from the year 1985. And before that, uh, it was known as the digital immigrants, and I'm one of them. And though I'm a tech savvy guy, uh, I'm a digital native, uh, but uh, the generation uh, who was born right after 1985, uh, they are known as the digital natives. Why they are called as the digital natives? Because they were born into the world in the typical definition Digital natives are also known as born digital or uh, web generation or net generation or millennials, especially uh, for those uh, people who were born right after year 2000, they are called exact native uh, digital native generation. Let's see how uh, we can understand someone is digital native or not. Uh, you can see such people around us uh, almost everywhere in the world, in metros, in the uh, undergrounds, in uh, uh, public transportation, in the schools, on, on the streets. Uh, you can see lots of young generation. They are busy with uh, doing walking or uh, talking to their friends. But at the same time, uh, all the time mobiles are on their hands. They are connected to the world. They are connected with their friends. They are connected with the community. And they are chatting. They are sharing. They are understanding. They are planning together. And uh, such people. Uh, they are typical digital natives. And sometimes it's really hard to uh, explain uh, the real digital natives that the whole world is uh, not only digital. For example, this uh, picture uh, exemplifies that uh, we have to uh, explain the generations that uh, in order to uh, newborns come into the world, some analog uh, exercises are needed. Not everything is digital. And this is the typical uh, identification of the digital natives. Can you, you can ask to yourself, am I digital native or not? There is only one evidence. If you have such a uh, uh, ultrasound selfie together with you from the uh, mother swamp, yes, you are digital native. If you don't have uh, such uh, ultrasound image together with you, that means you are digital immigrants. It means that their files are uh, started collected by uh, the doctors, uh, by the radiologists, uh, even they, uh, when they, are, they were uh, in the mother's womb. So they are all the time connected. They are all the time uh, busy with computers in the school, in uh, kindergarten, uh, at home, uh, in their daily life. Uh, you can see that the kids and the new generation, they are busy with a sort of electronic device, which is truly connected to the world. So that means uh, they only know a world, everything is digital. Now let's uh, jump to the second stage of the design thinking approach. And let's uh, try to conduct some surveys. Of course, uh, I have not conducted the service, but uh, thanks uh, God that somebody else uh, did a really extensive uh, research for us. And I would like to share that one uh, with you. One of the uh, largest uh, surveys um, has been conducted by a, a research company known as the User Intelligence. And uh, throughout their uh, research, uh, they have asked a lot of deep dive questions. Uh, they 
uh, asked those questions to the uh, generations aged uh, between 15 and 25. And the summary of the survey, of course, I will be sharing the details, uh, but the summary of the uh, survey is uh, they are totally uh, living a life uh, which uh, technology is intertwined uh, in that life. First of all, they are mobile first. They uh, were born into the world uh, uh, where, where the smartphones exist. So almost 100% of the uh, uh, surveyed youngsters, they have a sort of phone and uh, around 90% uh, they are smartphones. They are an, an online generation. They are all the time connected. Uh, nine, nine, around almost 100% has uh, an access to computer, uh, more than 80% they have uh, on their laptop. Uh, uh, some of them uh, around 40%, they have even uh, desktops and sometimes they share desktops. The share is uh, an, uh, uh, a, a term that uh, should be underlined because uh, they love to share. They love to share their laptops. They love to share tablets. They love to share their mobile. They love to share their ideas. They love to share uh, their problems. They love to share their life. They love to share uh, their friendships. So uh, sharing is a part of their culture. They are almost all the time on, almost spending uh, four, four and a half hours a day uh, in front of the computer screen, uh, uh, inter, uh, twinned with uh, that time frame. Some part of the time frame is also uh, dedicated to mobile access, but uh, some uh, part of their time frame uh, they are uh, using the mobile uh, explicitly. But at least two hours a day they are surfing, and if you are taking the internet from the hands of their uh, this young generation, the digital native generation they are losing their life. And they are crazy about their mobiles. They would like to keep the mobiles almost around because they would, uh, they would like to share. They would like to uh, texting. They would like to call their friends. Uh, and majority of them nowadays, they are using the mobiles, the smart uh, phones for social networking. They are a highly uh, social generation. They are almost interconnected uh, within more than a single uh, media. They are part of many social networks, including Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Snapchat, uh, some others as well. And uh, using the groups, messaging, texting, or uh, announcements through the WhatsApp or similar Vibers uh, like groups. So uh, they are using the uh, social media very effectively. In fact, the survey is, was dated back to 2017, and uh, their um, outcome is uh, these three applications are uh, top for digital natives, but uh, we know that Instagram, uh, Snapchat, and YouTube, uh, uh, they are also very uh, frequently used by digital, digital native uh, generations. These are the nice things, but on the other hand, this young generation, the digital natives, they are a little bit impatient because they have seen everything digital means that digital means everything is quite fast, quite speedy. Everything is quick. Everything is achievable. They are always connected. So if they wish something, it should happen uh, in a moment. That means the new generation which we are calling them as digital natives, they are impatient. And that impatience, it is creating a little bit bottleneck for them. Why? Because they think that every app is designed like uh, a group, uh, something uh, Google or uh, let's say Amazon, uh, means that billions of dollars are uh, spent and a huge team behind that, uh, they expect the responsibility of uh, every application as it comes from the hands of Amazon engineers or uh, Google engineers or Facebook engineers or Twitter engineers. And if something is not responding well, uh, or if uh, they are doing something wrong, if they don't know how to use the application, they are not blaming themselves and they are just uh, 
quite easily blaming the app vendors or the device because it was not designed so easily or uh, so ergonomically, or it's not performing uh, quite fast. And uh, a recent uh, research is just showing us that uh, the digital native generation can quite easily leave a web screen if it is not performing within uh, five to 10 seconds. So the new generation applications should be designed according to and uh, I will be talking about that. So uh, they would like to use the technology and uh, they would like to have fun. Uh, while they are using, uh, they can share the screen. Uh, one part of the screen is dedicated to social media and on the other part of the screen, they can share the game console with uh, friends, with close friends or the friends uh, from all around the world. Uh, they can play uh, different games at different time zones. And uh, it's not awkward to see that uh, your kid is just uh, waking up at uh, 5 uh, p.m. Uh, just to uh, play uh, jointly with their friends all around the world a certain game. And uh, you cannot just uh, tell them, please uh, wake up at 6 because you will be going to school. Uh, they are resistant for that one. But if it is uh, just for playing a remote game uh, with someone uh, from the other part of the world, yeah, they can quite, uh, they are quite motivated to wake up quite early and uh, being online. So uh, they love to take pictures. They love to listen music. They love to play games. They love uh, to watch videos. Uh, which are all professional applications. YouTube is a very professional application. Uh, the games are quite uh, professional. Uh, music uh, providers, Spotify and uh, uh, similar uh, apps, they are quite professional. Uh, all smartphones are providing a sort of uh, artificial intelligence to uh, magnify their pictures and uh, play with the uh, lightning and other things. And every day, since they are using such sort of professional applications, they expect everything as professional as uh, WhatsApp, Twitter, uh, Facebook, or uh, the likes. Apart from the mobiles, uh, they are uh, mainly moved from the desktops to uh, thin layered uh, tablets, and they are using the tablets as well. Uh, means that the apps, uh, the new generation apps, should be fit into the screens of both mobiles and the tablets. So design uh, mobile first is uh, not a theoretical philosophy, but it has to be a selling uh, edge at the end of the day. This is another uh, interesting uh, thing about the digital natives. They are quite multitasking. When you are just counting and uh, summing up all the activities, one digital native is doing uh, within a day, uh, it is ending up with uh, more than 20 hours. Uh, and the typical example is uh, just showing us that uh, a digital native is living 27 hours uh, per day. Since physically it is impossible, uh, then we can quite easily come up with the consequence that they have to multitask a lot of things at the same time. So when you see uh, digital natives, young generations, uh, they are watching TV. At the same time, they can talk to you as parents. And at the same time, they can text messages to uh, their close network on the social media. They can uh, do all uh, these things at the same time. And uh, most of the time, as all generations, we uh, as we uh, digital immigrants, we, we are thinking that, oh, someone is talking to me, but at the same time, he is busy with the mobile phone. Uh, in fact, this is a, not a typical resistance, but it is their typical life and it's their typical lifestyle. So they are all the time multitasking. By collecting all this information, now uh, for the second half of my talk, I will be talking about how we should design the app, next generation apps, so that the digital natives can quite easily adopt, accept, and start using. As this picture, uh, exemplifies, I like this picture so much because uh, most of the time digital immigrants are in a position that they are looking over the shoulders of digital natives because digital natives, they are fast, they are, uh, uh, they were born in the digital world, they can 
use any uh, sort of uh, app, any sort of uh, electronic device quite easily. They don't even need the uh, manuals, uh, but uh, as uh, we are the old generation, the digital immigrants, they are sometimes, we are sometimes envying the uh, young generation, how uh, they can easily adapt to the new problems and new solutions. And this is a typical uh, comparison uh, of digital natives and the digital immigrants. Uh, unfortunately, I'm on the right-hand side. Uh, I'm slow, I'm old, uh, and they're fast, they're uh, young, they're all the time future-oriented. We are most, uh, uh, most of the time looking back to the uh, past and legacy and trying to use our experience as much as possible. But digital natives, on the other, other hand, they are uh, ready uh, for learning new things and using uh, or solving the problems with uh, quite newly learned uh, approaches. They can uh, do many things at uh, the same time. Uh, in fact, we are not uh, that much capable uh, in that sense. Uh, we are serial thinkers. Uh, they love to capture the information through images, but uh, most, uh, mostly uh, we love to read books and try to understand the articles. Uh, even some of us, uh, including myself, uh, I love to print the text out and uh, read from the paper. Uh, but they can uh, quite easily go over the tablet screen and uh, capture the idea uh, quite easily. At the end of the day, uh, the basic difference is that we are more analog oriented and they are 100% digital oriented. So the result of the uh, survey is just telling us the first five items. What are they? If you are about to design an application, a system, a solution, a product for a digital native, you have to do it uh, in a way that your solution should provide quick access to whatever they require. They have to be as simple as possible because they hate to uh, delve into the details. They are a little bit surface uh, oriented, not the deep dive oriented. Provide visuals as much as possible. That means new generation apps should uh, provide a very handy and uh, uh, easy to use user interfaces. They can quite easily understand. You remember the uh, basic uh, uh, idea behind the success of uh, Apple and Steve Jobs, the magic two thumbs uh, so that uh, you can use your uh, magic uh, two uh, sorry, fingers uh, just to zoom out and zoom in. Uh, by providing that interface, uh, uh, he and his company uh, created a, a new generation for smart apps. And uh, Apple is today the first company surpassed the $3 trillion, uh, trillion uh, market cap. Everything should be self-explanatory. They hate to uh, read uh, additional documentation or additional information. Everything should be there uh, at first glance and everything should be self-explanatory. And fun is the indispensable uh, part of their life. Everything should be funny. Otherwise they can quite easily get bored and leave the thing. And I can add four uh, items uh, on top of that survey, they are, interconnected all the time. So we have to keep them always interconnected. Then cloud technology is a must. We have to keep uh, aside. Second, they love to have fun, means that they love to role play, means that they should be a part of every type of activity, every type of solution. So modern agility uh, should be part of the solution as well. And third one, uh, we have to give away uh, so that they can do something by your uh, by themselves. So do-it-yourself capability is quite important. And the underlying uh, message of today's talk is composability. I will uh, come to that topic uh, in a few minutes later. And finally, something should be simple. Sh something should be uh, easy to integrate it. Then any sort of solution, any sort of product should be like a Lego. So drag and uh, drop UI and drag and drop uh, user experience is quite important 
for the digital native solutions. In fact, uh, we have envisaged a similar thing uh, 15 years ago, and we have published two articles uh, in year 2006 in Integrated Design and Process Technology Conference uh, held in uh, San Francisco. Uh, we have published two uh, papers, joint papers. One of them is uh, entitled as the, we envisage the next big thing. And the second one is, uh, was uh, how to process the business processes. Uh, from the right-hand uh, article, uh, we have uh, conducted uh, a PhD uh, study in Middle East Technical University, uh, computer engineering department, and it, it ended up with a very successful uh, uh, PhD uh, thesis. Uh, and the left-hand side article, it has turned out to be a journal article, and we named this uh, the rebirth of a discipline, knowledge engineering. Why we called it rebirth of a discipline? Because knowledge engineering uh, has a history back to uh, 50s and 90s, uh, sorry, 50s and 60s. Uh, but uh, we have reformed the definition of knowledge, knowledge engineering so that people can compose knowledge by themselves to create the real knowledge engineering. The topic, uh, rebirth of a discipline in knowledge engineering, this article is all about providing a way to people so that they can compose and drive knowledge by themselves. So the crazy idea come out of that design thinking process is next big thing will be composable enterprise. What is composable enterprise? The composable enterprise means everything should not be designed, developed, tested from scratch, should not be maintained as it was designed and implemented before. There will be a new world so that there should be some assets and those assets will be there in a composable way. And we need a way to compose, orchestrate, choreography, uh, create a choreography uh, of such uh, assets so that at the end of the day, the digital native generation can compose the products, especially the software products by themselves provided by the vendors. The composable enterprise, uh, just a, a new term, uh, but uh, its idea is going back to the uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, it was started by the uh, computer-aided software engineering, and it goes through the model-based software development. And now we can give a real and uh, uh, practical name. It is the composable enterprise or composable engineering. And uh, to that end, you should have a, a digital business technology platform. Uh, that platform should enable uh, to define the assets by the vendor or by the third parties. And there should be a, a way to uh, compose those assets and uh, the platform or the solution should provide uh, the composability tools. So at the end of the day, the digital natives can come uh, and use uh, the applications uh, to create their own business processes, their own screens, their uh, own decision rules, and their customized and personalized application. And the next big thing, the composable enterprise, will turn out to be a huge uh, set of network. So uh, the simple composable applications and plus uh, more complicated modern autonomous uh, applications, they can be combined in a cloud environment and uh, by using all these pluggable parts uh, can be selected by the digital natives, used by digital natives to create the final applications very customized for themselves. How can it happen? So this is not only in theory, and as I told you, I will uh, give you an example. 
uh, and that example is a very good example, a digital native uh, uh, application. It is the Mambo uh, from uh, Germany. And Mambo is a modern uh, next generation banking platform. And in that platform, instead of writing the assets or writing the components uh, by uh, software development teams, uh, instead of writing the products and integrating them, uh, the people either from Mambo or from the Mambo ecosystem or Mambo uh, marketplace, they can write the assets that can be composed, that can be incorporated according to the specific needs of a customer. So the infrastructure should provide a cloud-based elastic environment so that assets can be defined, assets can be stored, assets, assets can be investigated and searched, and assets can be uh, composed to create a, a personalized uh, bank uh, within months or within weeks, not within years. It's a very disruptive approach. And in fact, it is running. It is available for today. So our case Mambo, uh, it provides five uh, different um, uh, facilities for its users. It provides a rapid business uh, 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 time to market uh, opportunities. It provides a flexible environment and flexible uh, uh, parts so that you can create your own story. Your, you can create your own digital journeys. Plus you don't need theoretically uh, but uh, more than 80, 90%, you don't need the support of any third party, even the uh, vendor Mambo. You can assemble your assets uh, uh, with the Mam Mambo core assets or some assets uh, developed by somebody as third parties and uh, stored in the uh, Mambo marketplace. Uh, you can compose and bring things together to create your own product. Finally, uh, it provides a sort of independence and independence from the vendor, even the Mambo itself. Plus it provides an independence from the uh, software imp implementation vendor. Most of the time, the customers uh, are ask asking us, okay, uh, you have a product, uh, you are uh, giving that product to me and you will be customizing the product according to my specific uh, needs and all my specific needs and the solution uh, to my specific needs, they will be part of the, uh, uh, they will be part of the product core. So your next customer can also benefit from that. It's a very good point for vendor, but the customer is keen on not to share their secret sauce. So uh, such a composable approach is also providing an independence from the uh, other users, other uh, customers of the same product. And this is one of the best for purpose for citizen developers. A citizen developer is a developer that is uh, empowered with no code or low code development uh, tools and technologies so that they can design their solutions by themselves without needing uh, an IT savvy guy. So the nice thing comes that instead of uh, lacking all the uh, cohesive parts of a software solution, you can keep the parts of that solution apart and you can use the best fit parts uh, for your uh, problem. And you can come up together all these best fit parts and you can create your own solution within weeks or within months. The Mambo approach or the composable enterprise approach because Mambo is a, a very nice example to composable ent uh, enterprise. Uh, you're not uh, going with the uh, typical software development life cycles. Uh, ecosystem is just uh, providing the uh, software assets so that you can compose. You don't have to wait for the next release of the software. Uh, you uh, should have a composable platform since uh, Mambo is providing that composable platform by itself. And the assets should be designed and uh, developed according to that uh, platform. That means any 
asset uh, which was developed and integrated to that, uh, to that platform can take part of your solution. And it should be cloud uh, aware, it should be cloud native uh, because the scalability is one of the most important requirements of today's customers, the digital natives, then the horizontal and vertical uh, scaling can be achieved by cloud uh, native platforms. Uh, every uh, component in the platform, uh, it is self-contained. That means uh, it is tested and approved uh, within the context uh, of that uh, asset. And uh, it is tested against the uh, composability with the platform. So you can change the component uh, independent of the others, as long as the interfaces, uh, promised interfaces are maintained. Uh, this is uh, well known from the software engineering uh, industry. It started with the component-based development, and it is now a sort of uh, upscale to uh, software product lines, and uh, the composable enterprise is also uh, creating a line for software product lines. And uh, so, uh, everything should be composed through the open APIs and uh, API by based integration is a must uh, as of today. And even today's uh, digital native generations, they start learning the composition of APIs at the age of five and six. So they know, even though they, they, uh, they don't know the uh, inner working details, but they know what is a JSON and what is the purpose of JSON. And they can combine the assets by using JSON at the age of uh, five or six. So uh, such a platform, a composable platform, uh, when provided to digital natives, they can quite easily adapt very quickly, very simply. And uh, it's a sort of fun. Uh, they can compose their applications by themselves. And of course, uh, creating the whole solution uh, from the assets, uh, it's uh, a little bit more straightforward. I even talked about the scaling uh, because cloud is providing the vertical and horizontal uh, scaling. And those assets, uh, they can run uh, in different parts of the world as long as the uh, MAMBU uh, infrastructure is running and they have already deployed their uh, composition platform to many uh, cloud vendors, uh, including the Google Cloud and the uh, Amazon Cloud. So you can just uh, put your assets uh, in a cloud environment, uh, in a distributed cloud environment, uh, and somebody else uh, from another part of the world, they can quite easily search, they can quite easily understand uh, its usage and uh, make part of their solution. And uh, this approach is providing a, a facility to the uh, business users, a continuous delivery, because it is a uh, an almost uh, un uh, disrupted uh, or uninterrupted, sorry, uh, uh, working uh, scheme. So uh, new assets are uh, deployed onto the platform. As long as they are deployed, uh, they can be searchable. They can be composable. You don't have to stop the things. You don't have to uh, shut down the servers. You don't have to even shut down the uh, parts of the uh, cloud. They are uh, behind the scenes and you don't have to deal with all these hassles. And uh, by having a variety of assets from different vendors, even including by yourself, uh, you can achieve uh, some uh, part of the solution in a more economic way. You don't have to ask all the time for the vendor. Uh, such an approach is just uh, taking the burden of uh, vendor lock-in as much as possible. And at the end of the day, such a platform is making you a, a citizen developer, which means you are using a composable uh, approach uh, or a product. You are not using a modular product. Uh, the difference between modularity and composability is that modularity is based on integration. Composability is based on consolidation. Modularity means cohesive interfaces. Composability means low coupled interfaces. So uh, by having such a platform and such an idea, 
a composed, uh, composable uh, enterprise uh, and Mambo as an example, uh, it is providing the core platform and core assets. And as you can see, the purple uh, one, uh, the uh, surrounding assets, they are implemented by the actual banks or actual users. Now, the people using such a platform, uh, they have introduced uh, their feedbacks. And according to the uh, feedbacks collected so far, composable enterprises, they can provide easily easy configuration, a declarative development experience instead of in imperative development exper experience. And the uh, declarative development is much easier than the imperative development. A uh, learning curve is not that much steep and it can quite easily scale uh, because of the uh, facilities provided by uh, cloud native platforms. It is open to uh, continuous delivery. Uh, people can uh, declare de de declaratively uh, create new assets and they can uh, put into the picture and the code is configurable. Uh, in fact, the, the configuration is the code itself. You don't have to deal with uh, the uh, code as in the case of typical applications. And of course, it is leveraging the no-code, low-code de uh, development. Uh, plus, uh, you can uh, quite easily build your applications. Uh, you don't have to wait, as I told you, uh, years and uh, several months. You can even create your own bank uh, within two months. Uh, the cases, real cases exist uh, uh, in that sense. And uh, your team, uh, your development team uh, can run uh, their uh, digital journeys in an agile fashion. And a nice thing is that uh, it is also coming up with an ecosystem. So the marketplace, uh, Mambo, uh, has a marketplace and composable enterprise approach. The idea uh, is all the time uh, coupled with the marketplace uh, concept. So uh, once you publish how uh, people uh, can create the assets, then uh, using such uh, definitions, they can create their own solutions and they can even sell their own solutions on the marketplace. So uh, by summarizing the uh, approach, uh, you can uh, achieve agility and flexibility. You can uh, decrease time to market quite. Uh, uh, much and you can easily and uh, very quickly go to the market. Uh, I have given the example. Uh, I know a, a bank uh, who has created their solution on that platform within two months and they are now uh, live. Uh, of course, it is providing lower total cost of ownership because uh, you don't have to uh, invest on uh, big hardware boxes, even big software. Uh, licenses, including the relational database management systems or uh, operating system licenses or management console licenses, whatever you can count on. And since you are the boss of your application, you can create better customer experiences. Now, an example, uh, this is the real uh, case user of a composable enterprise, one of the users of the Mambo. Uh, it's from the ABN AMRO. Uh, they have uh, created a, uh, they have uh, acquired a, a startup uh, known as Neve 10 and uh, their solution was running uh, on Mambo and they acquired that uh, startup bank and they created their digital only bank instead of uh, extending their own solution. This is a very typical uh, example, uh, Neve 10 uh, and ABN AMRO. ABN AMRO is a digital immigrant user and NIV10 is a digital native showcase. So ABN AMRO made a very good and successful move instead of transforming their digital immigrant solution to a digital native one, they acquired or they um, uh, selected a uh, digital native solution and going to the digital native market by a digital native solution. So the real outcomes, as I introduced, one of them is a uh, new 10 by ABN AMRO. And uh, by using such a 
digital native oriented solution, the composable enterprise, they can create uh, uh, tens of uh, accounts in a very short period of time, and they can uh, provide new loans very quickly, and they can acquire, they can uh, onboard new customers. And look at the figures uh, right uh, bottom of the slide. 65% of the customers are new to the ABN Unroll through uh, new TAN approach. Another example is the N26. It's a, a born digital bank and it was designed from scratch on that platform. And uh, they uh, went into the market quite fast. And uh, nowadays uh, they have uh, three and a, uh, five million customers in uh, more than 25 countries. And every month they are executing 1 billion transactions, banking uh, worth uh, banking transactions. And uh, I strongly recommend, please go on internet and uh, check the market values of N26 and NIF10. You will uh, be quite surprised because they are unicorns right now. So the conclusions, I have a very simple slide for the conclusions. Digital natives, they are new generation. They have different viewpoints. They have different attitudes. So do not try to transform your digital immigrant solution for a new product that should be given to digital native generations. Do not transform the early stage Formula, uh, Formula One car, uh, which is shown on the left hand side. How much uh, can you transform such a car so that it can beat up the uh, hybrid uh, Mercedes uh, Formula One car on the right hand side? There is no way. So if you would like to uh, provide solutions for digital native generations, means that stop transforming right now and start design from scratch with digital native tools. Many thanks. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I, I, I find it uh, very uh, inspiring and useful uh, as a person. I wouldn't uh, agree more. Uh, I have spent uh, most of my time with uh, software composition and composability, but now we are, of course, going towards system system level uh, composite. So a very interesting and very inspiring presentation. And uh, uh, I wouldn't, I said I wouldn't agree more since I have been spending my life with software composition. You know, we had a very nice tool in the past, which we call composition filters uh, and, and so forth. So uh, first I would like to get questions from the public. Uh, if there are any questions, please. Uh, I have some questions. Maybe in the meantime, uh, people may uh, may think about uh, of a question, but uh, also maybe some kind of discussion. So uh, uh, when we look at the history, we see the progress from code, uh, reuse, uh, bringing uh, libraries together. And then we have this module composition. Uh, as you know, uh, we have worked uh, pioneered aspect composition in the past, and now we are uh, leading to uh, a different level of composition. So uh, uh, flexible composition, but at more application or, or functional uh, level. Uh, we know from composability theory that at least uh, certain uh, conditions must be fulfilled for composition. One is, uh, you know, compatibility. Uh, it is uh, it can be procedural compatibility or incompatibility, and semantic incompatibility. It's said that procedural incompatibility we can uh, overcome through transformers or adapters, but of course, semantic in incompatibility cannot be. It's claimed that you cannot bridge it, so because they are incompatible, so that means we should define uh, compatible. Uh, modules and uh, uh, another aspect they say synchronization so comp compatible modules must synchronize in time because they have to work together okay we have some techniques for that but when we look at uh, semantic compatibility is a must when we say that then it means we need some semantic maturity right so that we can develop some uh, 
uh, components or systems, let's call them systems, where they can easily work together and they are semantically compatible. So that means we need some maturization, right? Maturity of the domain. You agree? Exactly, exactly. Uh, for example, uh, it's a very nice point. Uh, of course, you are uh, very well experienced in composition and uh, uh, we have been grown up by uh, reading your articles, uh, Professor Akshit, and your uh, books. Uh, you are right. Uh, and uh, the typical example is uh, the business domain uh, compatibility. For example, uh, Mambo is a platform for banking. You cannot use Mambo uh, for IoT or Industry 4.0. You have to have an, another uh, composable platform, uh, for instance, uh, for uh, Industry 4.0 or IoT related stuff. Uh, you cannot use Mambo for real time, for example. Mambo is for uh, transaction processing and plus, especially for banking transactions processing. Uh -huh. So domain is also a layered concept. It is not only business domain, but also the technical domain. So by uh, separating the domains uh, into different layers, you have to first uh, choose which technical domain or industrial domain you are targeting to. Is it uh, real-time systems? Is it uh, IoT? Is it uh, factory automation? Whatever it is, okay? Then uh, within the, uh, that uh, domain, you have to uh, separate or you have to identify the uh, subdomains for business context. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are targeting the transaction processing this is the upper domain, and in the subdomain of that one, yeah, you are directed to banking transactions, banking application. Uh, nobody can uh, argue that Mambo can be used, uh, let's say, for uh, airspace industry. It's yes. not prepared for that. So uh, that's a uh, very nice explanation. Uh, so we. Uh, we tradition, I mean, the comp traditional compatibility theory says this. So, okay, we, we know that uh, we agree on that, of course. What I realized is that uh, in the past, I have been working on one to many compositions or many to many compositions. Hierarchical compositions are not always capable of expressing them. We also call them cross cutting compositions. But when I look at also uh, uh, the way how we try to compose nowadays in a flexible way. Maybe we also have symmetric compositions, which means that uh, you have also indicated very nicely on your slide. So not only cross-cutting or many-to-many -many compositions, but also we need to support possibly, uh, I think, symmetric compositions, which means that we don't have to enforce unnecessary order to composition schemes. Uh, that's what I also learned today. So uh, thanks to your slide. I have one uh, question. So I had a actually very nice project I taught with uh, Softec. I, I, I hope it doesn't matter if I name uh, uh, companies and with uh, Ishbankasa uh, on uh, actually software composition, actually not software composition, but uh, as you said, comp compositional enterprise. Uh, the problem, of course, as you know, in Turkey is always, uh, mostly project-based uh, development. People really don't own products or don't de define platforms. Uh, uh, product line engineering systems of system engineering is also close, of course, to these ideas. Uh, we don't have really uh, education courses uh, uh, on this topic in Turkey, in many, many universities, uh, also outside. So we wanted to transfer, actually, uh, we, I worked there several months, actually, with many engineers to develop a prototype, very similar to example you have given. Uh, but it really, it really needs not only technical knowledge, but also the whole business and administration and all engineers must be somehow re-educated, -educ not to think in traditional forms of software engineering. This is really a different form of developing platform ecosystems, uh, software product line systems of systems. 
So I had I have tremendous difficulties in putting this into action. What is your experience? Uh, in fact, this is the main objective of this presentation, uh, Professor Rachid, because we are all digital immigrants. But the new generations, they are digital natives, means that they know all these topics by heart. So mm -hmm. they must suffer, suffer as much as uh, we do or we did before. Okay, that's but the why, managers that's are why, immigrants. <laughs> yeah, the, that's why we have to change our insight uh, for the future uh, software systems. We have to create software systems for their specific needs. My last slide, the conclusion slide, uh, I'm all the time uh, repeating uh, through my uh, sharings on uh, LinkedIn as well. And I'm telling that you cannot win a Formula One car with Haji Murat. Exactly, exactly. So actually, I'm still, uh, hopefully I, I may start, uh, I'm still looking PhD candidates uh, for this uh, banking, uh, as, as you said, composable banking. Uh, 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 architecture or uh, systems of systems, maybe product lines or ecosystems. Thank you very much for presenting. Are there questions now? Is there any question? Okay, we, we have recorded your presentation, so we will be happy to present it so people can actually, uh, this is a very important uh, presentation and topic because it should cause the mind mind change we have to change our mindset and this is our real obstacles uh, and most managers and, and people like us are immigrants and uh, we are ally aliens to uh, to this new world uh, but we rule the world so that's maybe the problem thank you again and i appreciate very much your contribution thanks a lot Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ashit. And uh, one final word from my side. If someone, uh, after watching the video uh, offline, uh, they can direct questions to you. You can collect the questions and we can uh, provide another video for answering the questions or we can just uh, share uh, in uh, LinkedIn or uh, some uh, of the medias that you can prefer. Thank you. Yes, of course, we will be happy to do that. And I also, uh, you can direct the question to uh, Mrs. Rabia Bilgücü. I also thank her for organizing this uh, uh, seminar and thank you for all for attending this conference or this seminar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye.